He said, he said both of his losses were to collective company decks. Yeah, and he said he really can't beat collective company decks. And he knew, he knew that coming into the tournament. And that's really the case in Modern, where there are some decks you just can't beat. <laughs> we'll see if this is one of them that Chafin can get by with his Grixis control deck. Is he going to start off with a basic forest and an ancient stirrings? Counter spells so important against this Amulet Bloom deck because there's only so much action in the deck. Chapin here in the main deck, two copies of Spell Snare, a Dispel, two Mana Leaks, a Remand, and four copies of Cryptic Command. Gruel Turf was the land that was found. Chapin will sacrifice a fetch land here. He's down to 17. Now here's a watery grave. So let's see what Patrick wants to start off with here. Scalding Tarn was the land that was sacrificed for Chapin. He's going to figure out how he wants to set everything up before moving forward. Deck and Graveyard are happy, happy. Sarah Vision is going to be the spell that's played, it appears, and it is. So he'll draw a card, copy of Electrolyze, and now he'll scry a little bit. Looks like Spell Snare and Serum Vision is the options here for Chapin. One Electrolyze in Chapin's main deck, which I really like a lot, is the type of card where, you know, the floor on it is pretty high. It's never going to be the end of the world to draw. And some matchups, it's your best card. Looks like both cards are headed to the bottom here for the Innovator. He'll pass the turn back over to Hain. Who do you think has the better nickname here, the Innovator or Insane Hain? The Innovator. Yeah? Yeah. I'm leaning toward Insane Hain, actually, as he's casting an Ancient Stirrings. Insane Hain's good. I always felt rhyming with your last name is kind of a cheat. I, I actually, I'm okay with it because a lot of people can't rhyme with their last name. So if you can, you should take advantage of it. For example, Phillips. Mm -hmm. I'm just stuck. I can't do anything. I don't think you can do anything either. What about Thrillups? Yeah. <laughs> well. That was easy. That, yeah. that took me two seconds. <laughs> you are a genius. That one's for free. You, you can, are. You can keep Thrillups. You are a genius. Exhibit Growth Chamber. That's the land Good for the Lord. turn. <laughs> There are some days I just wish I was you. <laughs> a little manipulation here from Chapin. It'll be a thought scour. And we'll draw a card. He's filled up that graveyard because he wants to delve. Is it Tasker or the Angler? It's Tasker, a turn two Tasker. Th that's what this deck's all about. Yep. He I can play a turn two Tasker or, or Angler in this deck. And you saw Shadow of Doubt get flipped over to another card that I love in Chapin's deck because it's much the same story as Electrolyze. Pretty low cost. It's never going to be a disaster to draw, and it's going to have moments of being so good that it wins the game by itself. Is it Summer Bloom time? A third Stirrings. Stirrings, it's kind of interesting in this deck. I mean, it, it of course finds lands and amulet, and it's finally found an amulet. Hain has gone through so many cards. He's got a blue mana floating. So we'll see if he can go full-blown nuts here. It doesn't take much. Well, the thing is, I, I feel like he really needs amulet this turn because if Chapin untaps with the counter spell wall up, it becomes really hard for him to get Summer Bloom or uh, Amulet to resolve. And at that point, he's just making land drops and trying to get to Primeval Titan or High Bind. That's very hard to do. So looks like Hain does have the Amulet. Very important this turn. There's a forest. There's another Amulet. Boy, this could, this could get out of control real fast. Chapin with only two copies of Colgon's Command in his deck to get these Amulets off the table. And of course, even if he has one, Hain goes in the next turn with the other. An island to draw. Attacking with Tasker, that's the easy part. Hang going to go down to 16. Now things get a little rough for the Innovator because this Bloom deck can get out of control. Well, he's still not cheating on the land drops just yet. If you can keep Alexander off of Summer Bloom and then start getting, getting to Cryptic Command, that's a game plan. 
Here's Colgan's command. So I imagine the modes here are destroy target artifact, of course, the amulet, and probably discard a card. Yep. I mean, I like going upstairs here, but even I would make him discard a card. <laughs> You know, you are who you are. Dong. Yeah, you are who like, you are. Because like, discard a card is sort of like going upstairs in a different way, so it's not... It's still fine, you know? Hayne will take a draw step. He's got one amulet in play. The deck goes absolutely bonkers when it has two, but just one right now. This is still relatively contained on Patrick's side of the table if Alexander doesn't have Summer Bloom and something to do. Cryptic Command still has an opportunity to be a big player in this game. Absolutely. Here's the fourth copy of Ancient Stirrings. Is he able to maybe find the second amulet again? One thing, it's unlikely that he'll ever miss with amulet in this deck, or excuse me, with Ancient Stirrings in this deck. But it is mostly there to find amulet of vigor. Found a Teleri West this time. Teleri West gonna enter the battlefield. It'll untap now. We might see a transmute of a Teleria West, and we will. We'll see what Hayden wants to transmute for. We see him aggressively use Summoner's Packs for Azusa. And he's going to search up a Summoner's Pack. But this is good news for Chapin, as long as he has a Counterspell available. What Chapin would not have liked to see that turn is if Alexander got Cavern of Souls, because that means he already has a Primeval Titan lined up, and the counter spells are no good. If Alexander is having to tutor for Primeval Titan, uh, again, Chapin's Cryptic Commands, his Mana Leaks, even Remand has the possibility of being very, very good, and he's got Alexander under some pressure here. Four turn is no joke. He's got some bolts and electrolyzes in his deck to finish things off. He just drew, drew land number four for Cryptic Command. I think that, that land was the big draw here because now he can play that untapped and bounce the Simic Growth Chamber and he might be doing just fine. He's going to pass the turn back for now and he might just be fine saying, I'm going to leave four mana for Cryptic Command and respond to what you're doing. The danger with bouncing the land is that if Alexander goes, okay, Summer Bloom, he goes Berserk this yeah. turn. So he's better off sitting on his hands He'll counter whatever, and, and Alexander, by getting Summer Blue last turn, is sort of representing, well, I, I'm going to try to tutor for Primeval Titan and cast it. And Cryptic Command's awesome against that sequence. If Alexander does nothing, I think then your play becomes online. Maybe he bounces the Growth Chamber at that point, assuming he has another counter spell in his hand and can afford to set him back. There's also the chance there that if Hayne doesn't do very much, Chapin also just does nothing. Yeah, for sure. There's nothing that says he has to cast a spell. Maybe he, he can... activates Tassiker. Yeah. You know, whatever. See where Hayne wants to start. He's going to float a blue mana and then play a Simic Growth Chamber. They'll get two triggers here, one to return a land and two to untap with Amulet of Vigor. Chapin staring at that Cryptic Command, trying to figure out how he wants to use this thing. Because one thing that Chapin could do here is say, okay, with the untap on the stack of Simic Growth Chamber, bounce it. And then you also have to pick up a land. Yep. But again, Summer Bloom makes that a little risky. I think that, that Patrick, at this point, if good opportunities to Cryptic Command for Tempo present themselves, I think he'll take it. But at this point, I think he's trying to save Cryptic Command just, just for the meat. He's trying to answer high-impact cards. If there's a really good moment to set Alexander back several turns, he'll take it, but... Hanging in the search of a path to navigation with this Teleria West. And, you know, this is an instance where Hayne is basically thinking, I'm at 12, I got time, I'm not underneath that much pressure, plenty of time to set her up and go crazy all in one turn. I have a Summoner's Pack in my hand to search for Primeval Titan. I've got a Pack Negation to defend myself against Cryptic Command. I can happily pass the turn back. Now, Chapin, he's going to play a Lightning Bolt. He's going upstairs. Now it's a Snapcaster Mage. Perhaps Hayne did not have as much time as he thought. Yeah, I mean, this is lethal. Now he has to defensively use Pact of Negation to stop this. Now Cryptic Command on a bounce land is oh, game yeah. over. Chapin set this up very, very well by demonstrating a lot of patience here. Mana leak the draw. Here comes the attack from Tassiger. Puts you down to five. He can aggressively use Cryptic Command if he'd like to bounce yeah. a Simic Growth Chamber. Get him. Yeah, I had a feeling you might say Get that. Yeah, he's, he's, he's working on it. 
That's exactly what he's going to do. Mm. Yeah, Love and, it. And Hayne knows he's dead because he cannot pay for the pact. Patrick Chapin is going to win this game here over Alexander Hayne. Grixis Control up a game over Amulet Bloom. The power of Cryptic Command strikes again. Alexander there without Summer Bloom. Wasn't able to get ahead on the land drops. Uh, Chapin's series of cantrips led to a very efficient Tassiger. And once he ripped land number four, it was just too hard for Alexander to play through Cryptic Command, given how much pressure he was under. Sideboard time. That means we take a look at Haynes first as he'll be on the play. Three copies of Leyline of Sanctity. A Hornet Queen, two Pyroclasms, two Seal Primordium, a Nature's Claim, a Ghost Quarter, a Forest, a Cavern of Souls, and three copies of Thrag Tusk. I'm honestly not that interested in anything in this matchup besides the additional copy of Cavern of Souls. And Chapin's deck I, has no discard in it. Now, Alexander may not know that, but I don't think this is a Leyline of Sanctity matchup. The creatures I don't think are particularly good. It's hard to value Chapin out with them. It's possible Thry Tusk and Hornet Queen come in. I'm skeptical, but the only card that I'm definitely sold on is the Cavern of Souls. We take a look at Chapin's sideboard here. Four copies of Fulminator Mage. We know those are coming in. Two Dispels, a Flash Freeze, a Counter Squall, a Slay, a Damnation, and this is a Caster, a Spell Skite, a Shriek Maw, a Batter Skull, and a Karanos Goddess Orb. So some weird ones there from Chapin. Well, you got four copies of Fulminator Mage and the one copy of Counter Squall. I think those are dead set to come in. After that, you get some kind of fringe options here. Cards like Flash Freeze and Slay are okay against Primeval Titan, though they're a little narrow in functionality. To me, the superstars, though, obviously the four copies of Fulminator Mage, uh, Chapin's best weapon post-board, especially if he's able to get one of those draws where he has a turn two Tassiger or a turn three Gurmog Angler. Backing that up with Fulminator Mage, that's a really potent opening against Alexander, uh, assuming that he isn't able to go nuts with something like Summer Bloom or Amulet of Vigor. You have to imagine Chapin coming into this tournament. You know his love for Grixes. He has documented that so many times in his writing. Coming into this tournament, knowing he had to beat this deck. Mm -hmm. And that might be part of the reason that he has four copies of Cryptic Man in his deck list and just has influenced a lot of his deck building and the way he plays the games against this deck. Yeah. Now, Chapin is... Uh, th this deck has a lot of high-level magic philosophy woven into it. You know, the one Electrolyze, the one Shadow of Doubt, they look sort of random, but Chapin is looking for a critical mass of cantrips to do what he's trying to do, which is get Delve spells on the cheap to make his Snapcaster Mages more powerful and so on. To that end, he's playing a couple cantrips where the worst case scenario is you cycle them, just like anything else you'd be doing, and sometimes they're going to have moments of being awesome. Now, once you have the second Electrolyze in your deck, once you have the second even Shadow of Doubt in your deck, you start feeling the inefficiency. You aren't curving out as well with your cantrips as you would like. But if you have a little bit of wiggle room, there's a lot of value to be gained by having some of these high upside cantrips. Four th Serum Visions and four Thought Scours to supplement the Tassikers, the Gurmog Anglers, and the four Snapcaster Mages. The deck is all about velocity. It's shaving out some lands as a result of all the cantrips. And uh, even some of the weird one-ofs have cohesion given what the deck is trying to accomplish. We had the uh, nickname conversation between the Innovator and Insane Hain people chiming in on their thoughts yep. using the hashtag GP Charlotte. They actually have a nickname for you here. Devin O'Donnell, uh, someone who did Top 8 at Star City Games Invitational last year, decided to call you No Mulligan Sullivan. Is that because that's true or because that, that just sort of rhymes? A little bit of both, I think. We could stick with that. It sort of rhymes. It's like a Drake rhyme. <laughs> like it sort of, it, it doesn't actually rhyme, but it sort of rhymes. We're taking shots at Drake here now. <laughs> Drake, I, <laughs> yeah, Drake, I believe Drake is watching. Yeah. So, hello, Drake. Yeah. How are you? Uh, how about Patrick Sulla wins by Andrew Lyons? Nope. Not for Not you. Not even accurate. No mulligan is closer <laughs> than wins. <laughs> you know? If we, if we care about accuracy at all. Uh, and I also have one here perhaps calling me the Phillips screwdriver. Uh, we got to get off this. Instead, I, instead, I'm, of, instead I'm, of Thrillips. I'm basically going to be hypercritical of every nickname that comes <laughs> down the pipeline. I appreciate it. It's Listen, it's not your fault. It's mine. <laughs> it's, it's on you. It's, it, it's on you. This is because of my disposition, not because these suggestions are particularly bad. We're going to find a nickname for you. I know at one point in your life you went by The Rainmaker. Yep, The Rainmaker. Yeah. Rainmaker Red, an, an infamous archetype. Mm -hmm. We'll find something that works for you. Nothing as good as the Innovator or Insane Hain just yet, but maybe our wonderful viewers can find a nickname that works for you. I do like No Mulligan Sullivan a little bit. We're, right, we're on the cusp there of where we need to be. Yeah, Rainmaker Red. I remember. I said, I said Infamous. I said Infamous. 
sometimes I refer to my decks as the stone tablets because it's a template for how to live your life better, you know? <laughs> sure, sure. Given from me to all of you. Quite, quite humble you are. That's, <laughs> that's very, very nice of you. All my decks are named Rainmaker Red if I'm not sure if it's good or the stone tablets if I'm sure it's good. <laughs> Amulet Blue might be the stone tablets. Yeah. As Hain will take a look at his opening hand. Weird draw from Hain last game with all those ancient stirrings. It wasn't bad. It, he just, he really needs Summer Bloom before Chapin gets his shield of counter spells up. That's yeah. really the recipe. From that point, he can start doing things like transmuting for counter souls and pushing through Primeval Titan. But when it's just a land drop a turn, even backed up by Amulet, Chapin's counter spells have a good chance of being functional. Well, he just found an Amulet off of Ancient Stirrings. So we, in the, the scary thing about this deck, is Patrick's starting with a Grieving Tarpit. It could be showtime right now. Yep. That, that's part of the power of Bloom. Even your bad matchups, your best draws still carry the day. Yep. Does not matter what's going on on the other side of the table. Did you play a land that earns the battlefield tapped? That was dumb. What's the best hate card against this deck? Blood Moon. All right, sometimes you're dead before you can actually cast a Blood Moon. That, to me, is the mark of an extremely powerful deck. Yeah, if, if, I'm, if I'm Patrick here, I'm breathing a sigh of relief that it's just a Cavern of Souls naming Giant and now an Amulet and a passing of the turn. I, I am thrilled that that's the turn. Because it could have been so much worse. Right. I mean, uh, again, Chapin's counter spells have the possibility of being very good here. Now, Cavern of Souls long term is a problem if Chapin is trying to lean exclusively on Mana Lake and Cryptic Command to stop Primeval Titan. But he can stop cards like Summer Bloom. Assuming that, that Cavern's on, on Giant, he can stop things like Azusa. And as long as he keeps Alexander off of the really explosive development, he has the opportunity to deploy one of his threats on the cheap, hold up a shield of counter spells, and repeat what we saw in game one. Steam Vents enters the battlefield untapped. That's why Chapin's at 18. He simply passes the turn back. Had the option to play Serum Visions. Elected not to do so. Waiting patiently. Maybe bluffing some counter magic. Maybe wants to play some Thought Scourers end of turn. We'll find out. Hain will play a copy of Teleria West. It'll enter the battlefield untapped thanks to the amulet. Now here's the Serum Visions from him. He'll draw a card, and now we will see some scrying. Both cards are going to stay on top. That's always scary. And just a passing of the turn. So perhaps what Hain is missing right now is a bounce land. Perhaps. Perhaps. Cryptic Command the draw here for Chapin. Or he just needs blue mana now. He could add something like a Gruul Turf, perhaps. Mm -hmm. I just want to cast your ambitions this turn. Remember, the Gemstone Mine, very valuable resource. The deck only has so many color sources of mana, and, and sometimes it gets tripped up on that end. So uh, he's going to want to be as judicious as possible with that Gemstone Mine. Maybe he's willing to step back his development a little bit and play Delaria West that turn to ensure that he doesn't have to tap the gemstone mine for blue mana. And that's part of the complexity here on, on Chapin's side is it's hard to piece together too much of what's going on on Alexander's hand based on this opening. Yeah, with, with a, a lot of possibilities. Without a probe or, or, or discard spell, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of guessing yeah. about what he's up to. Chapin's going to play Watergrave untapped, and he's going to play Fulminator Mage. Now, what's always interesting about Fulminator Mage, you talk to Bloom players, be it Hain, be it Chris Van Meter, Tom Martell this weekend as well, they've all said the same thing. Most people have used Fulminator Mage incorrectly against me. They, they just use it too fast. Yeah. So when is the right spot to actually make your move Fulminator Mage? It'd be very easy to say, why don't you just kill the land right now? Especially with pack payments being part of the equation, sometimes, but for the same reason that the gemstone mine's valuable, sometimes color re mana requirements trip this deck up. And doing something like casting Summoner's Pack, getting Primeval Titan, and then being able to pay for the pack on the, on the next turn can be tricky in the face of Fulminator Mage. Maybe you have to get one less value land because you need to get another green source of mana to be able to pay in the face of Fulminator Mage. Other Serum Visions. It's a lot of setup here for Hain, but as we know with Amulet Bloom, then a big turn happens, and it's hard to stop that big turn, especially when you have all this setup happening. Last game, it was a lot of Ancient Stirrings. This game, it's a lot of copies of Serum Visions. But the difference between this game and the last one is that Hain's not underneath any pressure at this point. He's yeah, at 20 still. Uh, Chapin has not had the opportunity to really cantrip very much. Yep. Very different than last game, where Chapin has a turn to Tassiker and then starts leaving the shields up. 
That was the recipe for success last game for the Innovator. And it's not like this draw is bad. Full Nader Mage is perfectly fine. You see a Crypto Command at hand, though it's unclear if he has a land number four at this point. And you have to imagine, given that he has not played Serum Visions yet, that he's got some action in his hand. It looks like he's finally going to cast the Serum Visions, maybe get a little deeper into the deck. Well, the critical thing for Chapin is ensuring that he has land number four. Yeah. Because then he has Crypto Command up. And given how slow Alexander's draw has been, Crypto Command might be a lot for him to work around. Remember, Chapin also has the opportunity to blow up that Cavern of Souls, and then it's hard for him to get things to resolve. Chapin's scry here, a mountain and a remand. That's what he's deciding between. Sam Pardee, Grand Prix Portland champion in the modern format, and Birthing Pod specialist back when that card was legal. He just won in the backup match, so it is party time over there. He's 13 and 1. Congratulations to him. Playing Blue Red Twin and likely in the top eight now. I'm assuming that's a lock, uh, especially if you can get a draw next round. And a great performance. Another notch on was already a, a really good resume for a, a pretty young guy. Yeah. Hane will take a draw step. Super Sunday Series competitors, welcome to round five. You may begin. There's Cavern of Souls. We know that Hain has one in his main, one in his board. And I think we're gonna name Beast this go around. Perhaps Chapin didn't see this one coming. As Hain might be trying to play just a more normalized game. Yeah, I, I think that Chapin's pretty well equipped to fight this sort of game. Okay. It's not, uh, Threat Tusk is fine here, um, but it's not the end of the world for Chapin to trade off resources with the Threat Tusk because Alexander's not really taxing many of his resources here. It's more about stopping him from, from going crazy, but there's a lot of individual cards in Alexander's deck that don't really matter. So. Uh, the Red Tusk, I think, is it's good in this spot. Certainly something castable, especially given how slow Alexander's start is. But uh, I think Chapin can work his way through with Red Tusk. Chapin's going to have Thought Scour target Hain. Turns over Nation Stirrings and a Pact Negation. Chapin will draw his card because he wanted both the Mountain and the Remand. So he did not want to target himself. Yeah. Really needed land number four. Yeah. And he'll just pass the turn back. If you have ever watched or played against Patrick Chapin with four mana in hand, Cryptic Command at the ready. He is surgical. You can have your 5-3, man. Yep. It's all yours. This is right at home for him. And what's so painful about this on Alexander's side, with the Fulminator Mage on Chapin's side of the table, and with the Cryptic Command in hand, Chapin could even conceivably balance the threat test and say, all right, cast it through the Gemstone Mines. Where are you out that way? It's just so flexible, that Cryptic Command. Colony Garden's actually going to draw a response from Chapin, which is, uh, it, this makes for a pretty interesting kind of dynamic where you've got two triggers from the Garden. You've got one for the Plant Token and one from Amulet untapping it. Amulet untapping it would give Hain a sixth mana to be able to play Primeval Titan, which would be uncounterable thanks to a Cavern Souls. So remember, one's on Beast for Thraktus, the other one is on Giant for Primeval Titan. So Chapin actually kind of has to respond now. Mm -hmm. And he can respond now by saying, you know what, Fulminator Mage, kill your Colony Garden so you don't get that mana. Maybe Cryptic Command something, but this is, this is a tough spot here for Chapin because if a Primeval Titan comes down, I don't think he's really well equipped to deal with that and Thrag Tusk. Exactly, that's just a little too much here. So with the trigger on the stack from Amulet Wine to untap the Colony Garden, Chapin's going to use the Fulminator Mage. Now the Plant Token will resolve, so no one's on the battlefield. That one doesn't matter too much just yet. Thraktos coming in the red zone certainly does matter. Chapin going to go down from 16 to 11. Hain will now play another uncounterable Thraktos. He's got to cash in two gemstone mines to cast this. Certainly worth it, though. Yeah, he's got his game plan here. I mean, he knows that he's not going to be able to... Certainly, he's not going to be able to hive mine, even if that card's still available this game. He most likely does not have Primeval Titan in hand, and uh, Chapin may be really well situated to answer everything else in the deck, but Cavern for Thraktos... Might be an out. And it was unclear if Hain would move into this strategy or not post sideboard because typically you see this against the black green decks of the world, your your Abzan, your Juns, or even just straight up black green. Cryptic Command, as great as a card as Cryptic Command is, is actually not all that great against Thraktus because if you bounce it like Chapin just did, it's going to leave a beast token behind. Although Chapin has a lot of breathing space with Cryptic Command. I mean, he can simply tap Alexander's team and draw a card. You saw him bounce the Thraktus back in the hand. 
and given Alexander stayed on land, it's going to be a little challenging for him to recast Thragtusk. Well, it feels like Kane is far away from recasting Thragtusk, but in reality, if you think about it... Any double land gets him there. Yeah, any bounce land, which he plays so many of, it'll untap because of Amulet, and he has Cavern Souls, naming beasts, so all oh, it takes is one of those Gruul Turfs or Simic Growth Chambers. All of a sudden, he's got Thragtusk back. Chapin looking like he wants to play a Gurmog Angler. But he's in a bad way right now. Yeah, the second Cavern of Souls, really rough on shape in this game. The one card out of the sideboard, that was Kappa was going to come in, been really nice with the Sarai Tusk. You know, outside of Haynes' play, which is always going to be close to flawless, he's very impressive to watch play, especially with this deck. His sideboards impressed me so much. The second Cavern of Souls and the, and the second Forest on the board yeah. have both been fantastic. Really, really good deck building from him this weekend. A Serum Vicious from Chapin is going to put both cards to the bottom. He's certainly looking for help right now. Looks like he found his copy of Slay. That is great. White Border Slay is awesome. It's been a long time since we've seen this card. One of 8th Edition's finest. Originally in Plane Shift, I believe. Yeah, Plane Shift Uncommon. There's a little bit of a hate cycle from that set. Execute as well. Mm -hmm. Destroy target white creature draw a card. Chapin going to play the Angler and pass the turn back. There it is. Yes. For you old school gamers out there. Hanel draw a card. Again, any double land lets him recast the Thragtusk. He actually picked up a copy of Boros Garrison. Looks like he was slow rolling a Simic Growth Chamber as well. It, it, it's so strange to see, you know, Hain, Hain loses his Colony Garden to, to a Formator Mage, has to lose both of his Gemstone Mines, and he's doing just fine. Yep. Here comes Thragtusk. JP going to take that hit. He's going to go down to six. Now Hain's going to play Sleslian Sanctuary. They get two triggers from this, one to untap from Amulet, the other one, of course, to bounce a land. Hain will add a mana from one of those caverns, likely the one that's naming Beast. Now he'll deploy Thragtusk. It's uncounterable. Five life going to be gained. The tough thing here for Chapin, too, is, you know, there are situations that exist because he's got so many Cryptic Commands in his deck where you can say, all right, you know, I'm going to play this weird game where it's attack me with my Gurmog Angler, tap your team, draw a card. Rinse and repeat that for a little while, as we've seen with Fairies decks over the year. Over the years, excuse me, but Thraktos <laughs> gains five life. Yeah, it's just too big. Yeah, so that that's also off the table here. So I'm not entirely sure how the innovator works his way out of this situation. And this is one of the spots where that Turbo Xerox philosophy of deck building is actually kind of punishing. Uh, Chapin does not have the bandwidth right now to spend even a mana on cantrips. He needs to be playing to the board with all of his mana every single turn. Yep. And he would really like to be making some more land drops here. All Chapin can do is pass the turn back. We might be in Cryptic Command mode here. Slay is also an option. Didn't think I'd be saying that today. I've seen a little uptick in Slay and Jun sideboards. You play one copy, you play in the mirror match, you'll be pretty stoked to have it. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of that matchup is about two for ones. Looks like Haynes ready to go to the attack step. Chapin has given him the green light. The beast token's coming in too. Right now, this is a lethal attack. Chapin looks like he's going to block the beast token. And now it is time to slay a Thrag Tusk. And that gets out of combat. Chapin falls to one in all of this. He gets to draw a card, picked up a copy of Dispel. A beast token will be left behind, of course. Chapin will go down to one. Hain will lose a beast token thanks to the angler. So Chapin's trying to work his way through this. Hain is going to play a copy of Boros Garrison. And the tough thing here is that he actually has a primeval titan as a follow-up. The cavern that he left in play, he picked up the one naming Beast last turn. He left the one naming Giant. So this Primeval Titan is going to be uncounterable, which means he'll get to search for some lands. And I, I believe he's built too much of an advantage. Yeah, I, if it was just the Thrag Tusk and Alexander was kind of out of action, it's possible, you know, Chapin next turn plays a Tasker 
And then he's actually got the Thrag Tusk and the Beast token checked for the time being. But at one life, this is too much to overcome. Gonna search for a couple of lands here. Will Hain gets to transmute. Maybe a pack negation, yeah, for a little bit of defense. We have seen this play before. Able to protect himself with this great board on the table. Chapin draws a copy of Snapcaster Mage, still has that copy of Cryptic Command in hand. The resiliency, the, ab the ability to shift roles, that, that's what makes this Amulet Boom deck so good. It had nothing to do with Summer Bloom that game. No. Nope. Nothing. Nothing. No hive minds necessary. None of that combo stuff. I'm going to play Thrag Tusk. You're going to try to beat Thrag Tusk. I'm going to play another one. That's hard enough for you to beat. The entire time, it's looming that I can do something completely broken. So it just contorts the way Chapin has to play the entire game. And the, the, the big thing for me, uh, the big difference in that game is Chapin did not have something on the board early. Yeah. Because his deck is not very good at making his land drops, he's, he's rarely going to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. He has a lot of counter spells, but it's hard for him to get in a spot where he's trading multiple counter spells together in the same turn because he's light on lands. So what he needs to do is get something into play, and at that point, Alexander's kind of forced to play into a mana leak one turn, into Cryptic Command the next turn, into Snapcaster and a mana leak the following turn, and so on. But if Chapin's not applying any pressure, that gives Alexander a lot of time to make his land drops, find the right mixture, whether it's Cavern of Souls or uh, the right threat card, what have you, and overload or invalidate Chapin's permission. So it's got to start with Grimog Angler and Tassiger, I think, on Chapin's side of the table. And probably early as turn two, Yeah, if we're being honest, because of how explosive Amulet Bloom can be. You think about game one, just compare the two games that we watched. Chapin in game two is able to play a Tassiger, and all of a sudden it's Hain's plays that are contorted a little bit because Hain doesn't get to do all of this serum visioning and setting up and pacing the game because I'm not underneath any pressure. Game game two, Hain had all the time in the world, got to play around Fulminary Mage appropriately, got to play around Cryptic Command, get his shop online while being able to threaten the ability to go crazy with Primeval Titan. Those games are night and day. Game one is how Chapin wants things to go, and, and truthfully how I feel he needs things to go. Yeah, he, he, in game one he was able to use Cryptic Command he had so much versatility with how he could play Cryptic Command. We were talking the entire time. He can counter a key spell here. He can bounce him at Growth Chamber, set Alexander back, et cetera, et cetera. That's because he was on the front foot. Yeah. And when, when that happens, Cryptic Command covers all of your bases. When you're at neutral, which is what happened there in game two, both players just making their land drops, uh, eventually Alexander can find the workarounds in his deck. He does have Cavern of Souls. He has some ways to play around Cryptic Command. He can also just set up two spells in one turn. There, there's a variety of options. So um, it's really important for, for Chapin to put him under some pressure, force Alexander to play something ahead of when he wants to, and allow Cryptic Command to shut all the doors. Game number three going to end away here between these two Pro Tour champions in just a moment. But if you are just joining us, Cedric Phillips, Patrick Sullivan here in the booth. We've got Nick Miller and Ken Crocker on the sideboard doing your deck techs, doing your quick questions, and picking these great feature matches like this one right now, along with the rest of the SCG Live crew. At SCG Live, hashtag GP Charlotte all weekend long for your tweets. We've been interacting with you guys all weekend long, and we have thoroughly enjoyed it. Yep. And we've been enjoying this tournament, too. We've got to watch a lot of great matches here. Great. If you had to summarize game one, you would say... Chapin got to four mana, and now he gets to leave up Cryptic Command. If you had to summarize game two, you would say Chapin got to four mana, and now he has to leave up Cryptic Command. Yeah. The very different modes. Chapin wants to be in the first one. And Hain made it in game two, where Cryptic Command wasn't even very good. No, it, uh, I think Chapin conceded with a Cryptic Command in his hand, mm -hmm. knowing that it was not going to help him. A Polluted Delta is where Chapin does start. Here's a Serum Visions for Hain. He'll have to take one from Mana Confluence. So he'll draw a card. Now it's time to scry here for Insane Hain. And we'll see where these cards do go. And Chapin's start of just a Pluto Delta didn't pass. It doesn't mean he has nothing to do on turn number one because he has cards like Spellstone in his deck, but I'm interested to see if there's a Thought Scour coming. Yep. Very odd for Chapin's deck to be missing on cantrips. I mean, he's got a lot of them. And really, you know, Serum Visions is a good card in Chapin's deck, but Thought Scour is a great card in his deck because it does facilitate a turn two Angler or a turn two Tasker, depending on how the cards do line up. He's very quickly you know, sacrificing his Delta, playing a Water Reaver on tap, going to 17. I think we're going to have a Thought Scour here in just a moment. We'll see if he can get one of those Delve creatures in play early. Yeah, that, that to me is the important part here. Once he's actually doing that, his cantrips become 
a lot more power. He almost moved to his turn. There's the Thought Scour. I was hoping he wasn't taking three for no reason. So he'll turn over two cards, and I'll take a draw step. So he's got four cards in the graveyard right now. Again, two from Thought Scour, one for Thought Scour itself, and then a Fetch Land. Now here's a Solve for Falls and a Passing of the Turn. So no insane Delve card just yet. But you see Grumog Angler. You see Terminate for Protection. This seems like a better mixture of cards than what we saw in game number two. Now we head back Haynes way. About 15 minutes left to go in the match, so I imagine enough time for both players to finish. I don't think time will play a role here. But we saw it yesterday when we covered Chapin, and it was a three-game match, and things had kind of dried out a little bit. He started playing faster and a bit looser when time became a concern, and I think that Thought Scout was almost the same thing. Yeah. He's, he's aware that 15 minutes is probably enough time to get this match done, but he doesn't want to be up against the wall here, and he's going to be playing a little bit faster as a result. Hayne with just a 10-to ice bridge and a passing of the turn. Chapin will pick up a copy of Sulphur Falls. That'll be the land for the turn. Perhaps it's time to go to the Angler. Again, he does have four cards in his graveyard. Well, now he's in the spot where he has to figure out, okay, is Exile Alexander slow rolling Summer Bloom and Insanity, or is he just going to make a land drop next turn? If it's the latter, this plays great, because next turn he has Cryptic Command, he has line number four already rolled up, and he's got a clock going. But this is an opportunity for Hain to go bananas yep. this turn. You can't see him, but Chapin's finger is at least mentally, they are crossed right yeah. now. Because if Alexander just goes land, go, Chapin's in great position. Much like game one. But you see Alexander doing some math, tapping his fingers on the table a little bit. Moving some cards back and forth. Okay, there's an amulet. There's a summoner's pack. It's going to be an Azusa. We have seen him do this multiple times this weekend. Yeah, sometimes you don't have Summer Bloom, but this is a way, especially with Amulet, to bridge yourself into five or six mana the following turn and start doing some really crazy stuff. And if you weren't with us yesterday, you might be thinking, okay, he's going to play Azusa this turn, play a couple of lands, have to pay for pack next turn, and then the following turn he can play Titan. No, no, no. We saw every time he did this, he was able to play Azusa this turn, pay for pack, and play Titan the next turn. Yeah. So he's going to start by playing Simic Growth Chamber. That's land number one for the turn. Pick up the Tendo Ice Bridge. Amulet, of course, is going to untap that. This will allow Hayne to play the Azusa now, and this will give him two additional land drops. So we'll see what the next land drop will be. And we know he's got a Tendo Ice Bridge in hand, so that's certainly an option at this point. It's very important for him to leave mana in play where he can pay for Summoner's Pack, even if Shape Encrypted commands one of the lands back to his hand. That's the most important thing in this sequence. Tendo Ice Bridge is one. Let's see what number two will be. But if this is not a two mana land, it becomes bad Cryptic news. Command, Cryptic Command is really bad news. Fulminator Mage is really bad news. Well, Vesuva will make sure that it's a two mana land. Yep. This is going to untap. We'll see what Landy wants to return. Wow, he copied Mana Confluence. A little surprising there. I mean, if there's a Cryptic Man on Zimmy Girl Chamber, this game could be over. Now, keep in mind, one thing that Hayne does have in his deck that we saw against his match and see, saw against his match against Michael Majors, that's a mouthful, was the Simeon Spirit Guide. Yeah, there's one so, copy in the list. So he might be enticing Chapin to say, hey, bounce my Growth Chamber, I'll pay with, with Simeon Spirit Guide's remove, and I'm fine. Because Chapin's staring at a Cryptic Man right now. Yeah, I mean, Chim is going through it in his head, and this is such a gutsy move from Alex if he does not have the Simeon Spirit Guide. Because Chapin showed Fulminator Mage alongside Cryptic Command. Very true. And now you can see Ch Chapin's going through his head. I is Alexander, would he put himself at this kind of risk right now, or does he have Simeon Spirit Guide or some other way to generate man in the upkeep, and this is a trap? Because he could have copied the Simic Growth Shaper. He could have insulated himself a little bit against this. Chapin's just going to pass the turn back. Wow. And now I think we're going to see Chapin perhaps kill Asuzo via Terminate. 
So this might slow down Hain's development a little bit. Hain will take a draw step. And Chapin's logic might be, listen, Alex is at 12. He's going to lose this turn or most of it to pay to the pack. Mm -hmm. I knock him down to seven next turn. I still have Cryptic Command in my hand. I can probably squeeze this, this game out and not have to put myself at some huge risk of Alex being able to surprise pay for the pack. Now I'm out my Cryptic Command. Now Azusa's in play. He goes to his main phase. And all sorts of fireworks could happen. Yeah, see, what's interesting about this situation, you know, if it's not Alexander Hain across the table, maybe Chapin just does bounce the bounce land. But you're playing against a Pro Tour champion, a multiple Grand Prix champion as well. So him copying that mannequin influence, that's no accident. Right. Or, or maybe it is. So now it's this game of what are you up to over there? It's all very, very unclear. Because if you're Alex, you're probably happier with him bouncing that land and saying, that's one less Cryptic Man I have to worry about, because Cryptic Man's so good against my deck. Absolutely. Uh, Alex is happy with that play, unless it kills him, yeah. which it might. But I think Chapin's saying, my hand's good enough. He's got Terminate plus Cryptic Command with Alex falling in life. He doesn't need to take that kind of risk. Oh, and the Shadow oh! Doubt. The Shadow Doubt is huge to counter the Teleria West. Huge play by Chapin. Those high upside cantrips we talked about a little bit earlier. That's a one-up in the main deck. That is brutal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, even Alexander has to enjoy it. What are you going to do? Hey, he's got a good sense of humor, but just that, got, that's he, a beaten. He just got shapened. Chapin will pass the turn back. The angler came across for five more. Keep in, this looks so much more like, like game one than he's, game two. He gets to leave up Kirkton Command. Yep. He doesn't have to leave up Kirkton Command. He's fallen to six here. Mana Confluence is... Uh, essentially shut off here as it would drop Alexander down to five and then Cryptic Commander Terminate will wrap up whatever the play is. This is going to be a tough workaround. Now, we saw Cavern of Souls last game and he's going to need something like Cavern of Souls naming Beast in the Thragtus now probably to win this thing. And he doesn't have a lot of time. No. And took a look at his sideboard very quickly. Wanted to make sure about his options that he still does have available. He'll play a Cavern of Souls. He names Titan to cast Primeval Titan. He's not out of this thing yet. I think I think Chapin has Snapcaster for Shadow of Doubt and Terminate in hand. Chapin's going to start by sacrificing his fetch line. Good mechanics there. And I think you were right about that. He's going to play Snapcaster Mage. And Shadow, I've never seen Shadow of Doubt be this good. Uh, Alexander can't sur search. The Primeval Titan dies. And then and he's he got dies. seven points of power at play. What's the worst case scenario if you're one Shadow Doubt? You cycle it. A little expensive, a little clunky, not the end of the world. What's the upside? 12 and 2. One went away from the top eight, potentially. Here is Snapcaster Mage. <laughs> he ain't taking a look at that graveyard. <laughs> Didn't think I'd see Shadowed Outcast this weekend, let alone twice in the same game. Players can't shirts libraries. Primeval Titan's just a 6-6. Six, six. Chapin's going to draw a copy of Steam Vents. Chapin says your, your Primeval Titan resolves. No trigger there. These kind of wins are so satisfying, too, because every little piece of Chapin's puzzle came out to play this game, this match. Chapin's going to draw a copy of Serum Visions. He'll play Steam Vents untapped. This is smart, too, just to make sure nothing goes wrong. He can terminate with Cryptic Command available. Take care of your Titan, and that is going to do it. Patrick Chapin is going to win this match here over Alexander Hain. Two games to one. Shadow of Doubt put that thing on eBay. My goodness. That was great. I, you know, and, and uh, you know, that's, there's the crossroads there in game three where Chapin has an opportunity to go for the kill yep. and just bounce a land. If Alexander has Simeon Spirit Guide, it's bad news because he pays for the pact. Azusa goes in the main phase. Who knows what happens? Usually there's only one Simeon Spirit Guide in the deck. But Chapin's philosophy there is it's Alexander Hain. He's not taking this kind of risk for no reason. The second is Chapin's hand's so good that he can afford to be a little bit more conservative. He doesn't have to go for broke in that spot. Terminate, Shadow of Doubt, Cryptic Command were the incentives to take that kind of line of play, and they were all awesome for him as that game progressed. That, that 
that's another thing that I love about Magic and why I love doing this is, you know, you get to watch two of the game's very best play. And we're sitting here saying, you know, Vesuva probably want to copy the bounce land so that you don't get ruined by Fulminator Mage or Cryptic Command bounce your land. And Hain says, I'm copying my Mana Confluence because I might have something Spirit Gun in my hand. I might not, but you're smart enough to realize what I'm doing, so you're not going to bounce my land. The thing is, I, I don't know how much the, the Vesuva on the bounce land versus Mana Confluence informs things, because it's still net one mana that turn. Sure. It, it doesn't give him any in